I'm advertising my favorite local bookseller. Although I should say, um, what is the one that you go to that we talked about? Makers and Quinn, that's another one. Support your local bookseller. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. So nice to see you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Mary Sullivan. Mary Sullivan, for those of you who don't know me, I am um, a long time student here at Dharma Field and I'm a founding member along with David, my husband, whose birthday it is today, by the way, um, and whose age I'm not going to reveal out of sheer politeness and fear that he'll say mine. So today, this is going to be kind of a complicated talk. I've never spoken from this book before. This book is called Questions to a Zen Master. It is by Taisen Deshimaru. Taisen Deshimaru is actually a Dharma heir of Kodo Sawaki, Sawaki Roshi, who was also the um, teacher to um, Shohaku Kimura. I think that's correct. Is that correct? No. Uchiyama, that's right. I'm sorry, Uchiyama. Um, thank you. And um, so they had the same teacher. So this was lent, this book was lent to me by a former member of Dharma Field and a founding member of Dharma Field. Um, and I found it a very interesting book. And the introduction is entitled Zazen, The Wakeful Posture of Awakening. I thought that was such a wonderful title because it says everything about his attitude toward posture in Zazen. Um, but first I'll just say just a little bit about Tyson Deshimaru. Uh, he was a Soto Zen monk and he spent a lot of time um, teaching in France. He came to France from Japan in 1967, and then he settled in Paris. Uh, he died in Tokyo in April 1982. Um, so um, he lived an ordinary life, whatever that means. Uh, he went to a university, got a job, married, and had children. But then it says, interestingly, what religious forces were at work in him in childhood. And he followed his master, Kodosawaki, for many years while continuing to grapple with the everyday problems of everybody with which we are all very familiar. Um, he wanted to be ordained, but Kodosawaki told him to stay as he was in order to have the experience of people who are not isolated by the monastic life. Um, in that way, according to uh, Sawaki Roshi, he would be able to offer a teaching that was more relevant to them, which I find very interesting. In due course, he was ordained and he received Dharma transmission from uh, Sawaki Roshi. And after Sawaki Roshi's death, he left for Europe um, as a Soto Zen missionary, interestingly enough, not the United States, but France as a missionary. And he arrived in Paris by means of the Trans-Siberian Railway um, alone. Um, and he spent 15 years in Europe uh, teaching Zazen, the practice of Zen, says tirelessly day by day. He certainly did a lot. It says he traveled and lectured constantly. At the end of 15 years, he had several thousand disciples in Europe, North America, including Canada, South America, North Africa, and over 100 dojos, meaning practice places, I would say, um, have been founded to practice and extend his teaching. He had a temple in Paris and another larger one near Blois in the Loire Valley. Um, I have a feeling his personality was more like Sawaki Roshi's than his other um, student, 
Uchiyama Roshi, who talks a lot about the discrepancies between his personality and his teacher's personality, Sawaki. According to this, Daishimaru's personality was blustery, sensitive, truculent, subtle, and inimitable. Um, and he had a great deal of energy that he transmitted. Anyway, um, he's published other books. This one uh, entitled Questions to a Zen Master. Um, and the subtitle is Practical and Spiritual Answers from the Great Japanese Zen Master. It's actually a series of questions and answers. The questions posed by, I get, I get the impression, a long time student and practitioner of his, and then his answers to those questions. Um, I, as I said, the title of the introduction, The Wakeful Posture of Awakening, um, points to, as Katagiri has talked about, the wisdom itself of Zazen practice. Um, Catherine, you're frowning. Uh, the wisdom of Zazen practice is, as um, Katagiri has said, Zazen is wisdom itself. Just wisdom itself. You don't have to go any further, look any further, do anything else. And that's the essence of Zazen practice, wisdom itself. So I did want to talk about that practice, Zazen. This book was translated from the French, um, just so you know. Um, so, okay, I already read to you about him. Uh, I just wanted to speak a little bit about what I've learned over recent years about Zen practice. Um, with another Zen student, I had a discussion downstairs in the basement after a recent Sunday talk. We were discussing an explicit instruction in the Fukan Zazengi. This is Dogen's uh, classic teaching on how to practice Zazen. Uh, Fukan Zazengi means uh, universal recommendation um, for Zazen. Universal meaning applicable to everyone, not just monks in a monastery. So in the middle of it, he gives explicit, explicit instruction in how to sit on a cushion, how to hold one's hands, leaving one's eyes gently open throughout, etc. And he says, place your tongue against the front roof of your mouth with teeth and lips both shut. So this discussion I had with a student downstairs is she was saying how she tried it once and she felt her neck tighten up. And it was very interesting because I decided I'll just try this and see what happens. So um, I did, I was in Zazen on a Friday night. I closed my lips, which I usually do because otherwise you really can't breathe through your nose unless your lips are closed. And then I closed my teeth. And it felt awkward at first, but then I noticed that I was more, I seemed, and this is a judgment call, it seemed to me that there was more awareness, there was more presence, I felt more fully present than I usually do if I let my teeth just sort of hang open or do whatever they do when my lips are shut. And I offer this because I feel like whatever I offer from this book can be used just as a guide, just to experiment with in your own practice. I think he has a lot of good things to say, um, but I'm not trying to force anyone to do this. I'm just offering this as a, another suggestion for practice. In June, I had my left shoulder replaced which really changed how I sit in Zazen for the better. Um, I sit on a chair, I don't sit on a cushion. So when you sit on a chair, your feet are flat on the floor, your hands are in the cosmic mudra, and you're sitting more or less on the edge of your chair, 
well, because I have really short index, uh, little, little fingers, when you sit in the cosmic mudra, in order to get them overlapping, I was rolling my left shoulder forward constantly. Well, now that I've had the shoulder replacement, I'm very aware of how to sit without rolling either shoulder forward. And I find that very helpful just to bring awareness um, to the practice itself. As it says, um, the wakeful posture of awakening. Uh, this has brought wakefulness to my practice. Just noticing, am I rolling my shoulder forward? Which I think did a little bit of damage to my shoulder. I've also, I also thought of this this morning. When you start adjusting your posture in Zazen, whether it be your hands, your shoulders, your lips, your teeth, notice whether you're doing it wordlessly or whether you're talking to yourself. Because I've also discovered that wordless awareness is fairly easily practiced when you're adjusting your posture. It's more difficult out in the world, but in, in the practice of Zazen, in noticing your posture, just not talking to yourself when you make subtle adjustments to your posture is much easier. And it also brings awareness to the practice if you're not talking to yourself while you're adjusting your posture. But I have to remind myself of that because otherwise I'll start talking to myself. I'm sorry. So I, ha I just had cataracts done and I'm still adjusting to having had cataract surgery in addition to shoulder surgery. And I take these drops and they go down the back of my throat and they make me really thirsty. But anyway, I've also noticed that I've become more gentle with myself in Zazen practice. So um, when, I, when I was taught Zazen by Steve Hagen in his living room, um, we were taught, of course, that when, you've, when you notice that you've, well, you, you focus on the breath. The breath is an excellent place to focus one's attention in Zazen because the breath is a unique focus of attention. It is both objective in the sense that you can observe your own breathing. You can observe yourself breathing in as you breathe in and breathing out as you breathe out. Um, so it's both objective and subject. You're having the subjective experience of breathing in and breathing out. And by the way, I didn't realize it at the time, but when I was taught to pay attention to breath by noticing breathing in as I breathe in and noticing breathing out as I breathe out, that that's actually paying wordless attention to the breath. But anyway, um, so when I first started practicing Zazen, I noticed I was very hard on myself when my, I'd noticed that I'd strayed from the breath. If it took me a long time to notice that, I was critical of myself. And it was like I touched a hot plate and I had to quick rush back to the breath and pay attention to it. Um, and just there was judgment in that. It was judgment in how I dealt with noticing that my mind was no longer on my breath. Over the years, um, especially now with the whole thing with the shoulder and um, just longer practicing, uh, I've become more gentle with myself. I don't jerk my attention back. I don't scold myself in any way. Or I, for the most part, I'm not going to say in any way, um, but there's much less judgment in that sense of returning to awakeness, the wakeful posture of awakening. I just love that expression. Um, so, um, he makes an interesting distinction. Uh, he talks about, and boy, I didn't write the page down, but I'll find it. Um, 
between Hishiri, Hishirio and Mushu. No, it's not a distinction. Hishirio, where there is no thought beyond all thought, true purity. I found that expression very interesting, true purity. Um, Like, let me just. Uh, true purity. Um, Jed gave an interesting discussion in his class um, on Tuesday um, about things as it is. Suzuki Roshi was talking about shoulds. We're imposing judgment on ourselves, on others. That's the kind of should that we ordinarily think of when we think of should. But um, it finally got a little bit clear to me toward the end of his talk that things as it is, according to Suzuki, is should. Things as it is, as they're showing up. That's true purity. Um, so this is not a judgment. It's not saying there's duality between pure and defiled. It's things as it is with no judgment, no sense of duality, good, bad, right, and wrong. That is things as it is. That is true purity, which he talks about. And I have no idea where this is. Um, he also talks about karma. He talks about karma in an interesting way uh, that I'm not going to get into because it's potentially confusing. Uh, but he says good things about karma that I think are worthwhile. He says on page six, um, the night before last, there was a boy here who was practicing Zazen for the first time, he said, I have just understood what real silence is. Until tonight, I have never spent one whole hour in silence in my life. The only time I'm quiet is when I'm in bed, and sometimes I even talk in my sleep. But Zazen, that is real silence. Um, and then uh, Deshimaru says, you were quiet in your mother's womb. That was silence too. And he said, but my mother talks all the time. <laughs> I have bad karma. And he says some very interesting things about karma that I'm not going to get into. It's, I don't want to be confusing, but he says some, he defines karma as action which is how we define it here at Dharma Field, willed action. But I don't want to go there because it's it takes us off in directions I don't want to go. Anyway, he says, I have bad karma. I always want to be talking. And it's hard for me to keep quiet, even in Zazen. And I don't know whether he means um, not to speak during Zazen or if he means not to talk to himself during Zazen. But then Deshi Maru, Maru goes on to say, but everybody's true origin is silence. You must understand that only silence is your true origin. He says, silence first, then incessant talking. <laughs> For 20, 30, 50, or 60 years, you have been talking nonstop. So then you get completely exhausted and return to complete silence again in your coffin. So silence is what goes on eternally. What you have that is eternal is your, he calls it consciousness of silence, but I would say awareness, the normal condition, the normal condition of your mind, he's saying is silence. Then he says, that is ku, nirvana the true origin. He says, in Zen, we say that we must go back to the original silence 
as in Christianity, they say, we must go back to the state before sin. Don't, don't be concerned with this. Take this lightly. He says, if you practice Zazen, you return to the state before sin. Okay, I'm going to read to you from Katagiri about silence. Um, and I did mark the page, fortunately, with one of the uh, wonderful um, bookmarks Jose has given me. Um, he says, this is in the section, page 39. Returning to Silence, which is the title of this book. And you guys are studying it on Thursday mornings. Is that correct? Uh, at some point, I will join you. It says, Zazen is the right gate for entering the Buddha Dharma. But he says, in case you're thinking the Buddha Dharma is something apart from you, he says, the Buddha Dharma is actually human life. So this Zazen is not an exclusive practice. It is the most fundamental practice for all sentient beings. For instance, when you really want to know who you are and what the real significance of human life, human suffering, pleasure, Buddhist teaching is, very naturally, you come back to silence. Even though, he says, even though you don't want to. And this, he's inviting you to notice your own mind. Even though you don't want to, you return to an area of no sound. It cannot be explained. But in this silence, you can realize, even if only dimly, what the real point is you want to know. Whatever kind of question you ask, or whatever you think, Finally, you have to return to silence. And it, then he, he says, this silence is vast. And he says, we cannot pin it down. Actually, what he says is, you don't know what it is. Um, he says, whatever question you want to study, you cannot study it from your own shallow viewpoint. Finally, you will come to a vastness that is like spring water endlessly coming up out of the earth. The more you study something seriously, the more you will realize that everything is boundless. I'm just wondering what to skip over here. He says, Zazen is to come back to no sound. Come back to the sound of no sound, and there's no contradiction there, and see it. It's not just your limited territory. It is a vastness from which your capacity, your knowledge, your nature comes, just like spring water coming up from the earth. This, ex this is Zazen. Exactly. This is you. This is you. Um, he says, there are many, many interesting things to do in the human world. We do get distracted. To do as much as possible keeps you busy making lots of sounds. That's fine, but you have to understand sound is coming from sound. And then, I'm sorry, yeah, that's fine, but you have to understand that these sounds come from no sound. If you always understand sound as coming from sound, you become confused and lose the direction in which you should go. Let me read that again. Um, you have to understand that these sounds, how busy we are making lots of sounds, come from no sound. If you always understand sound as coming from sound, you become confused and lose the direction in which you should go. You have to know no sound because no sound, no sound is your nature. 
then very naturally, you will want to come back from no sound and look at your own particular sound. He says, that's wonderful, then you can know it. Zazen is to come back to no sound. Come back to the sound of no sound and see it. It's not just your limited territory. It's a vastness from which your capacity, your knowledge, your nature comes, just like spring water coming up from the earth. This is Zazen. Exactly. This is you. So this is why we have to return to silence um, so that we can see that really there is no distinction between sound and no sound. That um, otherwise we're always making sound. And as he says, it leads to confusion. And Deshimaru says the same thing. Uh, that's why in um, when Steve teaches meditation and he gives instruction, he talks about wordless awareness. And as I said earlier, this wordless awareness of posture, how to sit, how to hold your shoulders, how to hold your lips and your teeth. It seems easiest to practice that um, if you're gonna practice wordless awareness. In this coming back to no sound, to silence, Um, okay. So, goody, I have a page number, finally. Um, I don't want to do that. So uh, he says, um, this is going to sound kind of weird. He says, when everything is done with, thrown away, meaning let go of, um, meaning you give up on trying to get anything for yourself. Uh, one becomes Buddha. And he says, one becomes God or Buddha, but he equates God and Buddha because he doesn't want, he's dealing with Fran French people who are largely Christian, who are largely Catholic. And so he wants to speak to them where they're at. So he includes God. He says, when everything is done with, thrown away, one becomes God or Buddha. For someone looking at a Zazen posture, the posture itself is Buddha or God. And then he says, the authentic thing is unconscious. So this authenticity that we manifest in our posture uh, is unconscious. This is an unconscious manifestation of God or Buddha. We're not trying to be God or Buddha. And in fact, it's delusion to think at that moment when we assume the Zazen posture to think that we're God and Buddha. He says, that's just plain crazy. Uh, he says, a crazy person always says, I'm not crazy at all. I'm in my own normal condition. Uh, but he points out that that's just plain crazy. So you have to let go of all of that. He says, that's why, in response to this question, that's why I'm forever saying that when you practice Zazen, you don't need to say to yourself, I must become like this or like that. You don't have to work that way. You don't have to. He says, unconsciously, naturally, automatically, you become it. Unconsciously automatically, naturally. And in fact, it can't be done any other way. You can't will it. That's where karma comes in and you will get it wrong if you do that. Um, anyway, he says, this is the essence of Soto Zen. And then he, he cites mush, mushotoku, without any goal, without any object, just concentrate on the posture of Zazen. Okay, 
And then he introduces this word, mushotoku, without any goal, without any object, just concentrating on the posture of zazen. I'm going to skip ahead now. Um, he devotes an entire chapter, starting on page 80, to zazen. He says, in Zazen, the normal condition of consciousness is hishirio, H-I-S-H-I-R-Y-O, non-thinking, non-thinking. Um, he says, when you think all the time, you're not in a normal condition. It's your imagination, your personal desires that are expressing themselves. You think more and more, you grow afraid, you grow anxious, and boy, I can attest to that. And if it goes on too long, complications arise and even madness, and you can drive yourself crazy with your thoughts. It's true. He says, in Zazen, you can return to a normal condition. And then he acknowledges, it's not easy to stop thinking during Zazen. He says, the process is that of Master Dogen's Hishirio. So, so as you know, for those of you who come to Friday night meditation and recite the Fukan Zazengi every other Friday night, or for those of you who attend sessions, and I know you recite the Fukan Zazengi uh, as in the last period of Zazen during the session, Dogen says in the Fukan Zazengi, um, think, not thinking. How do you think, not thinking, non-thinking? This is the essential art of Zazen. And I used to find that very intimidating, almost terrifying. What does he mean, non-thinking? This, this is practice. This is our practice. This is the heart of our practice. We don't need to be afraid of it. Um, as he points out, to some extent, we should be more afraid of how our thoughts can just totally confuse us, drive us crazy. Like I said, I can attest to that um, in terms of anxious thoughts um, and spinning around and around in my own mind. But anyway, he makes an interesting distinction between fushirio, F-U-S-H-I-R-Y-O, which means to not think, and hishirio, which means to think without thoughts. And here is where your experience is so valuable in Zazen. He says, if you deliberately try to stop your personal consciousness, you're still thinking. And as Steve points out in Meditation Now or Never, we cannot really stop our thinking. We can't do it. The more we try to stop our thinking, the more thinking we get involved in. It's just a contradiction in terms. We can't do it. Um, and how do, you, how, how do you do that? How do you tell, your, do you tell yourself not to think? Uh, and then you're thinking. Uh, and what instruction would you give yourself? But he's saying, but, Without, he says, without thinking is something you can experience directly in Zazen. Thoughts arise, and he says they come from the subconscious. I don't know where they come from, but he talks about karma and subconscious. That's a whole other topic. He says thoughts arise, but you don't need to stop them, and you can't stop them. He says being natural is the best just letting them go. Being natural is the best. He says, how can you use your personal consciousness to stop thinking? It sounds contradictory um, because really we're not trying to use our personal consciousness to stop thinking. He's, but his answer clarifies what sounds like a confusing question. He says, by concentrating on your posture. 
when the posture is good, the muscular tonus is right, and the state of consciousness is closely connected to your muscle tone. So he's talking about how the whole thing comes together. Um, when Matt is sitting, when the whole thing is unconscious and it comes together, muscle tone, awareness, non-thinking, we don't have to give it any conscious thought. Um, it's more difficult, I must say, it is more difficult sitting in a chair. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't sit in the chair without, think, with, without thinking, with thinking, that I always have to think when I'm sitting in the chair. Uh, I've proven that to myself. Um, he says, some people, well, I won't go there. The questioner asks, what does Zen contribute to the mind? An interesting question. I wouldn't have thought to ask that. He says, nothing. You must not want anything or have any desires at all. Practice without purpose. And the effects will come afterward automatically. And really, I think Katagiri might say, and the effects really are none of your business. Just keep practicing. He says, if illusions manifest themselves during Zazen, which is basically thought, one should neither repress them nor follow them up. It is very important to have no object in mind, to make no use of Zazen. Zazen is not a means to something. It is not a goal. If we have a goal, an object, our life will be troubled. We must follow the way naturally. If we have no object, he says, our life will not die. An interesting statement. Um, he says, you must not use the Buddha or Zen to obtain anything whatsoever. My master, uh, almost Koto or Koto Sawaki, was always insisting upon the idea of Mushotoku, no profit. That is the essence of Zen and of, Buddhiz and of Buddhism, obtain without trying to obtain. This will come naturally. Um, I think so in the chapter devoted to Zazen, he says, um, you the questioner says, you often say that everything is Zen. So why does one have to practice? An excellent question. He says, the only knowledge most people have of Zen is through books or the martial arts or Ikebana, which is flower arranging or the tea ceremony. He says, these things are all part of Zen. Just as every phenomenon is part of Zen, even toilet paper, is Zen, we've heard this before. Um, but if you don't have the experience of Zen, you will, of Zazen, you will understand nothing of Zen because Zen contain, Zazen contains the spirit of Zen. Without that, the rest have nothing to do with Zen. He says, the essence of Buddhism is in the practice of Zazen. If you have a glass full of liquid, you can discourse forever on its qualities, discuss whether it's cold, warm, whether it's really and truly composed of H2O or mineral water or sake. Zen is drinking it. Steve talks about this in the context of orange juice. Um, how do we know what orange juice is? 
can't really describe it. The only way to experience or orange juice is to drink it. The only way to experience Zazen is to practice it. it seems idiotically simple, but that's the truth. Um, he says, you can have an intellectual understanding of what is meant by concentration of here and now, an intellectual understanding. Sure, we all have some idea about what those mean, those words mean. Um, the philosophy of time and space, no profit, dualism, but the true essence is meditation, which consists, he says, of looking at oneself on the inside. All I teach you is the method you can use to, undersell, to understand yourselves, to answer the question, what is the self? Without the practice of Zazen, there is no Zen. If you practice Zazen, your whole, if you practice Zazen, your whole life becomes Zen. Toilet paper becomes Zen. But without Zazen, Zen is nothing. A beautiful temple where people do not practice is a temple for tourists, for ceremonies, a cemetery. Zazen is right breathing, right state of mind, right posture. It is not stopping thoughts, but letting them pass by, always coming back to the posture so that the posture will not give way. So he puts, so let me just say a little bit more about the posture. One thing we haven't talked about is how you hold your head. So for those of you who are experienced practitioners, I know this is old news, but when you hold your head in Zazen, you want to tuck your chin under and you want to feel like there's a string attached right at the base of your skull and it's gently pulling up. So your chin is tucked under. And later in the book, he makes a lot about this. When we stick our chin out, we lose that, um, hard to describe. we we'll lose, it, it's hard to concentrate on breathing. If you try it, I mean, try it for yourself. You stick your chin out and it's hard to concentrate on breathing. You kind of want to talk, your jaw is out and you kind of want to start moving your jaw. You tuck your jaw in and there's, it's easier to pay attention to the breathing to noticing breathing out as you breathe out and to noticing breathing in as you breathe in. Um, uh, he says more about his shirio. He says something very interesting here. He says, Sometimes people ask me why I practice Zazen and I never know what to say. That's the questioner asking him this question. And he answers, the answer is different for each person. The first time I asked my master, Koto Sawaki, what the advantages of Zazen were, he said, nothing. This answer piqued my interest at once. But one of my friends, hearing the same answer, got up and walked out. I, however, was hooked. I was caught. He says, what is the best answer? For some people, you must answer as though they were children. And I don't think he means this in a condescending way. He's talking about skillful means, upaya. He says, if you practice Zazen, you will become strong. But then he says, but if Koto Sawaki had answered me by talking about strength and good health, I would have been less impressed and perhaps I would not have stayed with it. But that answer, nothing, made such an impression on me that I am still practicing Zazen today. In any event, the object of Zazen is mosho, mosho toku, no profit. But each person is different. And before you answer, you must look the person in the face. This is skillful means, very interesting. Um, I'm not sure I'm up to it. Um, 
If someone asked me, I'd have to say nothing also. And I'd be hard pressed to use skillful means to modify that answer. Anyway, he says, the merits of Zazen are infinite, but just forget all that. Uh, we're at 1048. For some reason, I wanted to end with the teaching of the goddess. I talked about the goddess in my class on Monday night. Um, there's a dialogue between Shariputra, Shariputra and the goddess in the Vimalakirti Sutra. And it was relevant because there are two stories in the book I'm discussing in my Monday night class of in the Hidden Lamp about the goddess based on her interaction with Shariputra. But I wanted the goddess for some um, um, reverse reason to have the last word. So this is the translation by Robert Thurman. And she and Shariputra are deep in dialogue. And I like this because it also points to, and this is brief. I'm not gonna, this is a whole long discussion between her and Shariputra. And Shariputra says, goddess is not liberation, the freedom from desire, hatred, and folly. An excellent question, excellent question. And the goddess says, liberation is freedom from desire, hatred, and folly. She says, that is the teaching for the excessively proud. For some reason, it just makes me want to cry. And then she said, but those free of pride are taught that the very nature of desire, hatred, and folly is itself liberation. Why is that? Because they can be let go of. They're empty. They have no substance. They are non-substantial. They are, it's to become aware of our desire, hatred and folly is itself liberation. And I may have um, distorted a little what the goddess said, which was not my impression, my intention, but I did want her to have the last word. So I'm gonna stop now. It's 1051, this is not a class. And I don't have to keep talking until 11 o'clock. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Anybody online? As some people say in Zoom land. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. What is your name? My name is Rob. Rob, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Rob. Um, so my question relates to the eyes. Maybe you could talk a little bit about eyes. And I, I, specif I specifically am confused by not the concept of staring, but more the concept of focus versus unfocused. And what if your eyes start to unfocus? Do you consciously focus? When you say unfocus, what do you mean? I guess I'm going to say blur. Blur, okay. Yeah. That's an interesting question because I'm having problems with my eyes now after my cataract surgery. But um, so what we do, what I was taught is um, when you're sit, we sit facing the wall, do you sit facing the wall? So then you're far enough from the wall that you're not smack up against it, staring at the wall. And that enables you to look down at an angle at the floor. Okay. Um, and so that now, you can actually raise your eyes a little bit above that if you want. You don't have to stare at the floor. You can raise your eyes a little bit above that. Um, if your eyes start to blur, my question would be to you, what do you notice about your mind when your eyes start to blur? Or is that hard to say when you're not, when they're not actually blurring? I guess I would say that. Uh... 
I guess you're getting way more relaxed and less concentrated, I guess. I don't I've noticed it doesn't happen so much anymore. But when I, for years, when I practiced Sazen, I had to struggle with drowsiness and I would get drowsy. And I'd know the first, one of the first signs of drowsiness, beside the fact that I was kind of pitching forward, was that the wall in front of me would start to take on images. I'd actually start to see figures emerge from the wall as in a dream. That was a big hint to me that I had lost focus. So I guess my instruction to you would be not to allow your eyes to blur. And I'm going to turn to Steve Hagen and ask his opinion about that. Okay. I would say, if you, once you notice that, just bring your attention back to Don't allow them to blur. It sounds like when they blur, the whole thing starts to relax too much. Um, that's an excellent question. Mary. Yes. Peter yes. Hi, Mary. Um, first, I, I like the text that you chose today and uh, your um, your presentation was one of the best and uh, most satisfying that I've seen. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Peter. That's it, huh? That's it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Gosh, I thought it was going to be so much harder than that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you. Thank you.